Well, it's a beautiful afternoon. I've been so busy working day and night on this new radio project, my new publishing company. I got ghostwriting gigs, I got editing gigs, and just, you know, kind of creating revenue streams from multiple angles. I have two novels coming out, a documentary getting made, on and on and on. But I figure, if the sun is out, it's kind of chilly, but I'd take a walk out of my property and, uh, well, what happened is one of my freezers went out. It's a stand-up fridge for freezer. The fridge part went out, so a little bit of some meat went bad and stuff. So I figured I'd take it out here and just donate it to the uh, critters. This is a deer scrape. This is a mock, what I call a mock scrape, a mock rub, excuse me. See that vine right there? Every deer that comes along rubs their face on that vine and they scrape right there. That's why it's all cleared off. Um, but this is my tree stand is right up here. Oh, geez, I had a tree fall down. Oh, that's a good tree to cut up. That's another ash borer tree. You know, I just cut up, I just cut up an ash tree for, for firewood. And as you realize, this one fell down, must have fell down in a windstorm. So I'll cut this up and use it for firewood. This is great firewood. By the way, that tree right there is a, the, um, what is it, the Audubon Society? No, that's the birds, the, uh, the Society, Tree Society, I can't remember the name of it says this could be the oldest and largest yellow birch tree in the world. This tree could be 300, 400 years old. It is monstrous, man. Monstrous it, for the species of tree. It absolutely is huge. It's probably 35 feet around it. It's, you know, I'm standing 20 feet away from it. You can't really tell, but it's amazing. What do they call the uh, Arbor Society? That's what it's called. And we reached out to them. And we told them we have this massive yellow birch on our property and gave them a rough estimate of the size. And they said the next closest one to that size is in like Massachusetts or something. So they'd like to send somebody out and measure it. The problem with doing that is, is if they measure it and find it to be this like a, a, a tree of like the biggest tree in the world or of the species, they may make it so we can't alter the property around it. That's what they like to do. Like, oh, that's tree. It's you gotta, and and I, this is my food plot out there. This is all a food plot that I use for deer. And I plant it for deer every year. And so they might go, oh, you can't plant that thing for deer. So I'm like, and, they, and like, I don't really care if there's a sign next to this tree that says it's the biggest birch tree in the world, uh, yellow birch. It's just so massive though. This thing's huge. I like climbing in it. Got all this, all this uh, brush here. It's good for kindling. But this thing is just absolutely monstrous. I mean, I can't even. It's it's, it's huge. It's for this species of tree, all this yellow birch. Uh, it's crazy. But let's look at this ash tree here. This is. I, I'm gonna show you something too. That's cool. Uh, yeah, this birch tree. I could cut this down. You use this for. It's kind of rotten. I don't know how good it is. This is what what happened. This a ash borer beetle. If you look at the, all these little squigglies in here, um, they go. They kill. They're killing all the ash trees. So, and ashes are really good trees. They're hardwood trees. Great for furniture, firewood. They make baseball bats out of it. It's really good tree. But the uh, the ash borer beetle um, has basically wiped them out, and they're going to be extinct within the next ten years. All the ash trees. And this is what they do. They kill them. It's called the the cabrian or cabnian layer. This is the layer underneath the bark where the water comes up, where it, it sucks water up through the cabnian layer. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And the beetles separate it from the bark and the tree, and the, bark, and the tree can't get water, so they slowly kill it. But this is, this is good bird, uh, wood to burn. And I just cut down two of these things. Well, one was falling, and another one was, we did cut down. A, man, dude, that was a big tree. It was way taller than this one. It's like twice as tall, twice as big. I got the hell out of the way. My neighbor cut it because I ain't got the balls to do it. Because I don't, you know, I ain't got the balls to do it. Look at this. Oh, this one just stuck in the ground and hit. But all this will make for good firewood. I'll clean it up and it makes for a lot of good kindling. And this is enough wood probably to heat my home for two weeks. So that's what I use. But that one's pretty cool here. A friend of mine who was my neighbor where I used to live, he didn't shoot a deer this year and I have so many deer on my property and stuff. And this is one of my little food plots. This is what I call the pre-plot. Can't really see much of it now, the deer ate it all. But you can kind of see the outline of it here. 
and this is where I planted a bunch of lettuce and alfalfa and uh, clover and all these different things here for the deer and they'd come here every night before they go out there the bucks won't go out there until it's dark till it's pure dark but the does and stuff may come here first and attract the bucks so my neighbor who didn't shoot a deer i made him a blind and by the way blue is one of the few colors that deer can see they're colorblind so i had to cover that chair up with um camo and well i actually made the net here i kind of I had this, 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 I made a blind for him, so it was kind of like, like this, but I did cover that thing too with an old camouflage jacket, and uh, I told him the deer are going to come over that little ridge right there, about a, starting about an hour before dark, you'll have your pick, wait till you get a nice, um, nice mature doe, you don't have to rush it, there's going to be several, so the first night he hunted, there was a lot of rain, and the deer don't like to move in the rain in the wind, I found, so, and I kind of told him that when he got here, I'm like, probably not gonna you might not see anything it's 50 50 the rain they're, they're spooky in the rain they don't move in the rain and so he didn't see nothing and i said come back in a couple days and the weather's nicer and he called me he says you know weather good today? i said the weather's good come you'll get a deer today and so i'm in the house working you know my house is only you know i don't know 250 300 yards away and uh i said uh i'm sitting there working actually i was in the kitchen at the time like getting something maybe something to eat or something and i heard bang and um and sure enough, I come out here and he got a buck. So this is a little blind that I made for him. And I, I, I could hunt in this spot too. Um, I could have. And that wasn't my intention because I hunt from a tree stand. And my tree stand basically is, it's up here. And it's it, it's just a better vantage point and um, better opportunity. This is a dull, good doe hunting spot. But the bucks like to stay back in the woods a little bit. And, uh, and I only saw, uh, I think, six... I think I saw probably eight, ten bucks this year, last year, but only like four or five of them were like decent bucks, you know. Here's another mock scrape that I got right here that the bucks use a lot. And I'm, my tree stand is right up there, up in that tree right there. So, I mean, and the bucks, they come here and along, they, they rub on this, they go to the other one, they kind of make their way out in the field. But they only come around during the rut. They only, they only come out in daylight for about two weeks of the year, if that. In fact, I saw all my bucks within a seven day period. So all prime rut. I think I saw them all from November, November 14th. Then I went out, to, went to L, or where'd I go? Did I go to LA? I went to LA or New York, one or the other for a couple of days. No, I went to New York for a couple of days and I came back and like the day I came back, I saw two beautiful bucks come in right here. But they weren't shooters. They weren't shooters, but they were they were nice bucks. But uh here's my tree stand up here. So I'm just gonna I got this these sausages here that are probably bad. They were you know a little bad. I'm just gonna throw them out here and some porcupine and not a porcupine but a, a raccoon or a skunk or something. They're starting to come out of their hibernation right now. They'll get it. But you're gonna see something that is cool is at least I think it's cool is this scrape right here was the natural scrape bucks a buck did this and they did a lot of work on it and they worked the ground over look you see the footprint right there from a deer and there was a branch here that kind of hung off and a mature buck uh got in here and snapped that branch off with his rant with his antlers both right there and right there and the day that I saw those two bucks back to back within like a five minute period, two nice bucks that were almost shooters, but you know, they weren't bigger than my last bucks. I'm not going to shoot them unless they're bigger than my last bucks, which means they got to be a whole year older. And I was like, eh, I'm not going to shoot them. So I just let them walk. And it's a very high probability that one of these farmers or one of these poachers or somebody around here shot them. Not, not a hundred percent though, because I, on camera, I've, I've gotten since I lived here on camera all at night, except one. Uh, one buck came to a, uh, I got him on camera three days in a row at the same stand, right at my up front stand. And then I went to hunt there on the fourth day and didn't see him. I think he probably heard me come in or smelled me or whatever. He's looking for does because he made a scrape right there. And but that's the only three-year-old buck that I've seen on, during daylight on camera. The other at night. But I've seen probably eight or nine. Th I have one frame of a, of a, I have one frame with three mature three-year-old bucks in it. Like they're all fighting, they're you know all in one frame, like kind of gathered up, posted up. 
with each other. Three mature bucks, which for around here is insane. That's crazy, man. Three three-year-old bucks. All their racks were wider than their ears, and they were big bucks. Well, that was the first year I was here, so I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to get a nice buck, no problem. Nah, it wasn't that easy. I blew a shot on a deer that year, a really weird deer that year, and then uh, it was like a three-point, but a big giant one. And then since then, I didn't see any bucks. And then I've gotten better. I've learned so much about what I'm doing. So I've gotten kind of so good. I have a much better eye. All I really need is like a mature buck to make a mistake. I keep a lot of does around. All this food plot and everything I set up, it's all for does. The food plot there is the food plot there is the big food plot out there. And this keeps where I'm seeing 10, 12, 15 deer a night does. Now, if there's all those does, when a buck gets in rut and he's horny, and he really, he, he'll throw caution to the wind. He'll like, F it, I'm going for one of them does. And he, he'll follow the scent trail and he'll come right to me. That's that's the goal. That's the whole. I was just looking at this tree. You want to see something? Look at this tree right here. You see where it's all scraped up right there? You see where it's bleeding? That's from a buck. A buck came here. And this tree has been beat up for years, man, by bucks. I mean, you can look at the damage that has been done to this tree from bucks. It's been scraped and rubbed on bucks. For its whole life basically and it's it's hard to believe this tree's even alive the, the, the buck has these bucks and that's been the reason they do it because it's the prime spot this is exactly where bucks where does are and so the bucks when they scrape like that they're basically telling those yo this is i'm boss hog and if you come around here if you're in you know heat if you're horny i'm the boss hog in this neighborhood hang out here and I'll find you. And that's basically how it works. So they'll make these scrapes and rubs and they usually do a trail. I'm approaching, my, my property goes for like another 200 yards. Um, this starts to be like my berry briar. It's pretty cool. I got all this kindling. I need to, I need to pick up the, 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 the deer, some of them will bed in here, but not too often. It's kind of too close to the, Humans, you know, not how beautiful it is here though. But some will bed in here, especially at night. They'll go out in the food plot out there or in my field right there and they'll eat and then they'll come right back out here and lay down and sleep. And you can see it's kind of matted down. It's from them. I gotta cut up all this kindling. But if you look over there, I have a massive berry briar on my property. Massive. Look at a pile of deer poop. I, uh, that's all berry briar. I have like, probably four acres of berry briar it's all blackberry and some raspberry and it's just a massive uh yeah i could, I could cut up some of this wood too it's probably too far gone to run some of it might be good this might be good yeah that's pretty solid yeah i could cut that up i'm looking at that big pine tree that fell over there i could probably cut some of that up i'm just looking at for next winter man look at all these trees that are down here just come out here with a chainsaw there's so much wood i can cut up anyways this is beautiful this is my playground i come out here to play this is the berry briar this is all blackberry and by the way look at the size of this freaking tree that fell over bang i don't know if any of it's any good but i mean it's like too big to, to, to cut like down here it is, but I cut these other pieces, and down at the end it might be good. But uh, look at that tree right there. That's a big bur uh, uh, beech nut tree that fell over. And some of it's rotten and no good, but some of it's good. There's a tree over there. There's, there's lots of wood around here. I don't know why I buy wood every year. And like, why? The problem is it's a lot of work cutting it up, and you, you can't really get back here with the four wheeler. So you gotta you kind of get a little close. But then you gotta cut it and then you gotta drag, you know, carry the. Oh, there's a nice big pine tree over there. But you gotta carry the wood. And so a lot of this wood is rotten and no good. It's been down for 10 years probably. Some of it's good over there though, dried and real seasoned. I got a giant freaking. I think it's a red pine over there. I nerd out on this stuff. Oh, that's a nice tree too. Oh, that's a good tree. Right there, I think it's a maple. That will definitely cut up nice. It's a lot of wood right there. That's a that's two weeks worth of firewood. You know, but propane is as expensive as a mother uh, up here. To fill my my 500 gallon propane tank, it's like a thousand bucks. 
I like to heat with wood anyways. It smells better. I like, I just like it better, I like heating with wood. So all this wood can be cut up. Look at the size of that Mondo mother sucker though. Ooh, we, that's a big ass tree. It's a white pine, not a red pine. I have some red pines in here. I did chop up some of the wood over there. You can see it's pieces of it I cut up. I'll cut all this up. Boom. This one's fresh limb broke off this year. This tree's old. This is a 200, probably 200, 250 year old tree. It might be a red pine. Maria would be able to tell the difference. She can look at the needles and know the difference. Look at all the limbs that broke off though, the low limbs. Look how many of them broke off. Bang, 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 bang. They're all laying down here. Crazy. Anyways, my little playground that I enjoy. And I thought I'd share it with you. Take a few minutes out of my day to um, ah, to walk my property. You can see this just broke off. It's still green. It hit the ground so hard to snap a piece in half. It'll be burnable by next year. It's just beautiful back here. This is this is my playground. It's only 20 acres, so it's not like I own a massive piece of it. But but by me, close to me are hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands of acres of state and federal land. So I'm going to be doing some more of my survival shows. I'm going to cut that tree up too. Not supposed to burn pine too often in your in your fireplace, but I do a little bit. I got to get my flu clean. I got an old tree stand, I mean deer blind over there. I've only hunted in it one time and got a pretty crazy story to that. To that I, I was, I was you know, my first year here, after hunting for a few weeks, I kind of spooked all the deer out of my property, um, onto my neighbor's property. So I figured I'm gonna see how they're, where they're moving. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneak over here into this blind right there. And the first day I get there, I open the door. It's a raggedy old blind. It's not in great shape. It's falling apart. So I go over there and, and this is all my property. It's been clear cut. So it's been select cut. So there's, there's I'm looking for dead ash trees, man. That's, Huh, there's a, there's a live ash tree right there. It's still alive. That's surprising. Ah. Um, so I come in here and I see another, I see a big old tree over there, a hinge cut. So I come over here and I open the door to that, that blind right there and there's a big fat raccoon sitting in there. And he's like half hibernated sleeping. So I open it up, I'm like, yo bro, get out of here, man. You know, beat it. And he's looking at me, and I kind of, like, nudge him with my foot. He don't try to bite me or nothing. He kind of just scurries. And I got to scurry him, like, get, get out of here. Because I'm not, like, it's me or you, bro. I'm using the blind. Get the fuck out of here. And he waddles off. It was funny. But, um, so then I sit in the, the blind, and I see, I wait about a half an hour, 45 minutes. And here come the deer. They all start coming. These are all pickery berry briars or pickers. And the deer eat these berry briars, too. They eat them all down. They're, they're all eaten down, if you look. They're all been nipped off at the top. All of them. Most of them. Nip, nip. The deer, they eat that all winter because they don't have nothing else to eat. So these briars are like super robust during the, during the winter. I want to transplant those pine trees right there, though. Those are nice. I wish I would have saw them a couple years ago when we were transplanting. I would have got both of them, guys. So I'm sitting here, and uh, here come the deer. Three, four, five deer, and they're sneaking along. You can kind of see my property line was where the berry, the berry briar ends it's my neighbor's property and they're sneaking around sneaking along and i get one that it's like over there about 40 yards away just out of my range i don't see if there's a raccoon in here or anything right now probably not it's too warm i think it's beat up and so i said it was a real windy day so i said i'm gonna get out and try to stalk this deer because the wind was covering my track like i it would cover up the sound of my track so I get out and I start stalking this this doe who's about 40 yards away. And true story, that's a big old tree too right there. What is that? It's an oak tree? Um, and so I get to where I'm about 35 yards away and I'm crouching down. I'm about 30 yards away. The wind's blowing and she sees me. She stops and turns at me. I decided to take a shot and uh I, I my pin is zeroed at like 35 yards for whatever dumb reason I, I i anticipated she was farther away than i thought so i aimed about a foot high thinking the air you know the bolt would drop i have a very powerful crossbow 
So I shoot, phew, arrow goes right over, Moshe takes off and I miss. So, but, I, but it would have been freaking, it would have been classic Fred Bear, Ted Nugent, gangster, had I got out of the, t- and, I, and had I got out of the blind and stalked my way 30 yards towards a doe who was like feeding through this berry fryer and like stuck up on her and, and downed her with a, with a crossbow at 30, 35 yards. <laughs> I blew it. So that's what it is. This is not so easy to move around in when it's, uh, when it's, um, the deer do move through here a lot. But when it's, when it's like summer and fall and there's, and these berry bars are all grown, there's leaves and crap on them, it's, you can't get through it. Like it's almost impenetrable. Very, very hard to get through. Right now they're all eight down by the deer. The deer all along where it's accessible, like down in the middle of the stick stuff, they haven't nibbled it all down. This is what it normally looks like. So if you look at this, this patch, you can kind of see what it normally looks like. Well, it all looks like that normally, but as you get to where it's kind of more open, it's all nibbled down. That's from the that's from the deer. I do have a blind into that pine tree over there, and after I shot a doe one day, oh, I'll finish with that story. It's a great story. After I missed this doe here with the stalk, I only had a day or two left in the season, like two three days left in the season. I'm gonna go shoot a doe. I know where they're going. I watched them from that blind every day for like three days in a row. And they come out out there and they move them out right on the edge of this berry briar and they make their way out to, to the edge of my property or my neighbor's property and they move out into the field to get to the, the food plot. So I end up going over there in the corner, right on the corner of my food plot or in a corner of my property and my neighbor's property. And I don't even use a blind. I don't use a chair. I don't do nothing because I know the deer are coming. I know. So I've watched them three, four nights in a row. I know what they're doing. I know what's going to happen. So I walk up to a tr- this tree and uh, I basically sit there, got my crossbow cocked, and I lean against this tree like this. Now I know the deer is going to come at some point. It won't be long because I'm there. I'm about an hour and a half before sunset. So within a half an hour, the deer start coming. So I get against the tree and I got the GoPro on my head. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to kick the p- GoPro on. And like, you know, just get ready in case one shows up. And all of a sudden, I look up and here comes a young yearling doe, yearling deer. And she comes running up towards me and gets about 10 yards from me and stops. And she's like kind of looking at me. And then she starts eating grass or whatever she's eating. And her mother is right behind her. And her mother seems, uh, the wind was blowing this way. She, she couldn't smell me. But she sensed something wasn't right. You could tell the mother was definitely like, something's up here, something ain't right. So she starts like sniffing around, sniffing around, but she don't get my wind. She goes out in front of me about 20 yards, 25 yards, and then cuts with the wind. So she can't smell me unless she cuts back towards me. Now, I thought about shooting the mother. I, I, like, I, I, I struggled to turn the GoPro on because she was kind of half looking in my direction. I get the GoPro on and I'm like, I could shoot the mother, but here's the problem with shooting the mother. If I shoot the mother, which is a nice mature doe, the odds of this yearling surviving are maybe 50-50 or less, probably 30% chance. The mothers are so much smarter. They're way more in tune with the, the predators and you know what's around them, and, and they'll keep, they keep their babies alive. Uh, the babies aren't that smart. They're not that intuitive. They're just kind of stupid, man. I, I could tell you story after story about how, how goofy they are. I, mean, I, I, I took a pee in a tree. with a deer. I had to pee so bad, and there was these two yearlings and a doe in the field right in front of me, like 10, 15 yards. And I, I got to pee. I was making a video. I'm like, I got to pee. I can't take it. So I reach back into my backpack. I have a pee jar and I pee in it. It's going really loud. And this yearly doe is looking up, looking at me, looking at me. And I'm waving at it. In the video, you can see me going, ah. and it, it's kind of looking at his mom and looking at me. It's looking at his mom. Like, it's basically saying, Mom, you see this? Are you seeing this? It's something in that tree, man. Something right. But the mom don't see me. She's facing the other way. So the, the, the yearling just kind of just sits there. I end up peeing, feeling this jar. I'm giggling. Put the jar back in my backpack. Nothing. They're just not that smart. So if I would have shot that that yearling uh, doe, the mother probably, I mean, that mother, the yearling probably wouldn't make it. But, you know, that's all part of nature. The coyotes got to eat. Bobcats got to eat. It's what it is. But I figured I'd wait and give one a chance. So I let those go. And then about 45 minutes later, I'm still sitting against a tree like this, and I see four or five deer making their way towards me. I'm like, all right, I get ready. There's th- like three, probably two or three mature does in the bunch. So I'm going to wait. And sure enough, the, you know, the first doe in the bunch makes her way towards me at about 15 yards. And it's through a bunch of brush, so i got to kneel down, and i got to shoot through some brush, and I'm kneeling down. 
and I took a shot that I shouldn't have. I kind of sh shot fast because I was trying to get it on camera. I wanted to get the shot on camera. And I take this shot, but I felt good about the shot. Bang, I shoot it. I hear it run off, and then I hear it like the death wheeze. If you shoot a deer and it goes, you know, it might go 50, 75, 100 yards, and you can kind of hear this wheeze it makes, that usually means it's dead. And this is like two minutes after I shot it, so I know I got him, right? So I wait about 20 minutes. It goes onto my neighbor's property. So I call my neighbor and say, hey, I got a deer down on your property. I'm going to be back there looking for you. Cool. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So it's snow on the ground. So it was uh, like December 29th. And um, <clears throat> so I go back with the flashlight and track the blood. And it only goes like 70 yards. But I come walking up and the hole is in the back leg. And I made the worst shot. Somehow, somehow I shot it in through the back hip. And like kind of a little bit, maybe three inches in the stomach. And it was just a horrible shot and it shouldn't have killed the deer. Uh, the only thing I can surmise is that the deer, I uh, hit an artery, a main artery in the leg. Uh, and shattered the, the femur, which is enough to like make it not run far. And so it only went like 75 yards and then lay down and then died within a minute or two. It bled out. Um, but that was God. That was God saying, you know what? I, you know, I don't want you to feel guilt. I mean... I would have felt so guilty if I had known I would have wounded it. Because that shot should have, that deer shouldn't even, I mean, it pro that deer would have gone three, four, five days before it died, you know, in agony and horrible pain and just suffering. And cows probably would have got it. They would have got wind of the blood and they would have thought it's weak and they would have got it, which is a horrible death, getting ripped apart by cows. But um, the guy was like, no, you know, you're going to learn from this. So after shooting that deer, I told myself, never again. I'll never take another shot at a deer unless I know it's a 99% kill. Because there's no such thing as a 100% kill shot. Not you know, not really. Unless you got a rifle with a scope and you're at like 20 yards, probably 100%. But, uh, I mean, I said no. So the next deer that I shot was an 8-point buck. I shot it at about 33 yards, made a good shot, boom, double-longed it, went like 90 yards, it was over. But, um... Never again. I'll never shoot a deer. I don't care how big it is. I don't care if it's a big giant buck. If he's at 35, 40 yards away and it's not a good broadside clear shot, I won't take it. It's better to let him walk and just say, hey, I saw the deer than, than to shoot it and wound it and then have it run off and die and you never get it or and have it suffer. So I won't do that. I'll always shoot. I'll always make sure I got a good shot from now on. It was kind of a learning lesson. I, and that's life. You, you know, you learn, learn from life. Everything you do is lessons. Anyways, my property. That was a big beech tree right there, man. I don't know what killed it. My guess is some kind of beetles or bugs or something. And uh, and then it, it, it got weak. And then it snapped. Let me this freaking cat, man. It got weak and it just snapped off. This is all deer trail. You can see the deer tracks here. A bunch of deer poop. If you look, tons of deer poop. Yeah, that thing must have made a hell of a snap when it went down. But now, you know what's living in there now? A porcupine or a raccoon. I see a hole in the tree up there. There's probably a porcupine or a raccoon living in there right now. And look at the bottom. Look at this. Oh, yeah, this thing's... Oh, my pickers. Oh, my... Oh. 100%. There's a porcupine or... Probably a porcupine living in there. And yeah, that's what they do. Is. And look at the, look at the freaking... The uh, woodpeckers did this tree, though. Woodpeckers put a hurting on this mother sucker. Crazy that they can do that. I mean, they, they hear a bug in there that's freaking five inches deep in that tree, and they'll hammer away until they, they find that grub rooting around in there. Look at that. You hear them. You can hear them in, out here oftentimes. Oh, there's a nest in that tree somewhere up there. This is some dead limbs I could cut off right there. That's a good dead limb. Anyways, so you get to see a little of my property and what I do when I get bored and I need some fresh air and I want to go just get some sun and spend some time with God and some alone time. Maria's in a meeting right now. That's one of the main reasons why I took off. I said, she like, wanted some privacy for a meeting. So I said, all right, no problem. I'll go to this deer trail right here. A lot of good wood here. I see a whole another tree over there that I can cut up. I got lots of wood to cut up. I'll never be want for uh, 
firewood. That's a big tree. Probably maple. Look at all that kindling. All I gotta do is drive out here with my four wheeler and chop that up. Look at this though, big trick pine tree fell over. This kind of sucks. I don't like to see that. Oh my god, look at that. He, like half that pine tree broke off, man. Wow. I, I can make a hell of a shelter out of this thing. If I was out surviving in the woods, this is where I'd go. I'd, I'd build this. Look at this thing. This massive limb fell off. Holy crap. Look at You know, I, I must have had something wrong with it. I see all that sap coming out over there. I'm not sure what was wrong with it, but the wind, the weight. I mean, pine trees, you know what it was? I'll tell you what that was. Pine trees usually grow in a straight line and don't have massive limbs that grow off of them. For whatever reason, this particular tree here decided to grow a secondary limb that went off the main beam, right? That doesn't usually happen with pine trees. If you look around, that doesn't happen. That's a, that's a cedar right there. It never happened. So what happened with this particular tree is this big giant limb, for whatever reason, decided to grow off the main beam. And it got so big, look how big it is. It got so big, it got too heavy, and it just, its weight just popped it up, ripped it off the tree. It's crazy. Cut it up and use it for firewood. That's a lot of firewood right there. Not, you shouldn't use pine, but it's okay if you let it season for a few years and that's kind of some of the sap dry up. So I'll just let it sit here for a couple years. If I'm even here in a couple years, I'd like to buy a property up in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, or Alaska, if I can convince my wife to move to Alaska. She don't want to do it, but I do. I'd like to get out in the middle of nowhere of Alaska if I can. But if she's willing to go to the middle of nowhere, Upper Peninsula, of Michigan, which is almost like Alaska. It just keeps us closer to home with friends and family and civilization. You know, if you're if you're uh, out in the middle of nowhere, like like my dream, it has like a float boat, right, or an airplane float plane, and we fly in 50, 60 miles to a house on a, like a salmon stream or river. And if you got to go to a store, you get in your boat and you drive to, you know, 30, 40 miles to the, to the nearest town or maybe where you have a car parked. And then you get in your car and you drive, like an old truck or something, you just park it there. It's like a little, you know, parking lot or something. And you park your boat, get in the car and you drive to the grocery store and you come back. But she's like worried, we're old, what if we get hurt? What if there's an emergency? You know what I mean? They got people with planes and helicopters and crap for that, bro. She don't do it though. She don't like it. So I guess the UP, which is my playground anyways, I love it. It just doesn't have the giant, the giant brook trout and the splake and the cutthroat trout and the things that I really like. But it doesn't mean I can't travel there and, and, go, and go fishing. I'm, I'm working on a, on a, a new uh, series, a YouTube channel, based on my off-the-cuff playlist. I have a producer interested in producing it. I have multiple people in, interested in producing it, and they think I would be a perfect host for a show title off the cuff where uh, I just go around out in the wilderness and go on these fishing, hunting, camping adventures, which, you know, it's like a dream come true to me. So, and they're like, you know, they're willing to pay for it. And all I got to do is myself, be myself and go fishing, you know, hunting. And it's all kinds of crazy adventures, everything from hog hunting to these different types of trout species adventures and camping, survival, all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, you're, you're funny. You're an interesting host. People will watch you. We'll market it. We'll produce it. And, you know, you spend money on marketing and advertising. And I'm like, I'm down, bro. Hook me up. Let's do this. I'll happily split the money with you. So there's that. And if that happens, well, it'll be a dream come true. Then I can just focus on my work, my writing, and then hand off my businesses to management. And then I can just uh, enjoy my life fishing and hunting. Yeah. I'm back at square one, basically. There's my giant beech, birch tree over there. All right. This is a big mondo tree. I, I actually put a stand in this tree and had a uh, a lot of deer encounters here. Well, I'll end it on one final one. was I had my stand in this tree. It was a good stand. It's a big tree, too, man. That is a monster tree. And anyways, it was a, kind of getting evening time. It was getting dark. I had the GoPro on. I wanted to shoot deer on the GoPro. And there was a doe right there. I mean, right 15 yards in front of me. They were all coming out right here, funneling right out here. That's, I, my stand was like 50 yards over there, but the wind blows this way, so they were winding me. So I moved my stand over here 
So because they come down this, this kind of ridge line here and come out right there and the wind's blowing this way so they didn't see me. That's all good. They were coming out and I was seeing them every day. This big doe, big mature doe. I, got, I gotta get a tree, I gotta pee, man. I, it's, it's dark now, it's almost dark. It's too dark to try and shoot on the camera, you won't see. And I could have shot her, I mean, it was light enough for me to shoot, but not light enough to get her at the shot on camera, so I said, hell with it, you know? And anyway, so, I, and I had to pee real bad, so I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna climb out of the tree, man. She's sitting right there, she's like 15 yards from my stand. And I'm in this tree. And I climbed down this tree, all the way down my 20-foot ladder, I have a 20-foot ladder, and I climbed down it, and that, tree, that, that doe just sits there watching me. The whole time just staring at me staring at me I, you gotta be kidding me i, I actually pull out my phone and video it. i go this is dope. she's sitting there watching me she's, she's right there 20 yards away watching me but it was so dark you really couldn't see it but it's crazy man i don't know what her problem was she she was fascinated by me she didn't know what the hell the hell i was doing and i didn't know what the hell she was doing i haven't talked to my neighbor in like a year and a half because he is 45 year old nephew sh posted deer right on the property line of my property and it ran right through my property he called me he's like oh i got a deer down I'm like he shot it with a rifle i heard the shots boom boom 10 minutes later he's like i got a deer down and it was right where he, the deer down it's where he said he shot it was right where i heard the shot oh, no i shot with a bullshit there ain't no bullshit me man man dude you ain't got a bullshit me i know you shot it with a rifle bro and he's like no i didn't shoot. i said you call my wife a liar because maria was putting the chickens away when she heard scared the crap out of her. I mean, the chicken coop's right there, and the shots were right there where that barn is. So, high-powered rifle, bang, bang. And so, I mean, I gotta put this this meat uh, here. And I was like, bro, you don't. Have to, I was, so I said, you call my wife a liar, bro? And he looks down to the ground. You don't say nothing. I said, yeah, that's what I thought, bro. And his, his cousin goes, well, maybe you should have called the DNR. I said, I'm not calling the DNR, bro. I spent 13 years in prison. I'm not a rat. Not gonna, I'm just asking you, please, as a neighborly favor, as a courtesy, you know, how about not shooting baby bucks on my pro or on the border of my property? And he's like, well, not everybody's after trophy bucks. I said, well, I am. And I'm trying to grow mature bucks on my property. So I'd appreciate if you don't sniper young bucks on my property with a rifle during bow season. I appreciate that. Please don't do that. And I, my, my neighbor ain't stopped talking. He ain't talked to me since. He used to plow this all up and get it all good for uh, for my for my deer season. But he he don't don't want to do it no more. So because he don't like me because I called his nephew out on his poaching crap. Anyways, I'm gonna drop this meat on the ground. Let the, the scavengers get. It. I've had a couple of eagles coming around lately. Uh, there's a I put a deer carcass over there, and I'm catching some eagles. The two eagles uh, eating on it. So that's pretty cool. All right, God bless. I'll upload this and I'm out of here. It's a beautiful day. I got to go back to work.